Okay, seven o'clock, time to go. Welcome everyone and good evening. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us. My name is Julie Becker. I'm a vice president of the League of Women Voters of Bucks County. And before we get started with our program, I would just like to go over a few things with you. Um, first, closed captions are available for tonight's presentation. To enable them, all you have to do is just click on the CC live transcript box on your Zoom taskbar. And then once enabled, it's possible to move those captions around your screen to another location by clicking and dragging them. All meeting participants, other than myself and our presenter, Diana Dakey, will be muted. If you would like to ask a question or share information, please type it in the chat and I'll share your questions and comments with our speaker after her prepared presentation. This program is being recorded and will be made available through, through our league's YouTube channel. As long as you remain muted during the meeting, you will not appear in the recording. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that provides voter education and services. We encourage active, important participation in government and advocate for issues like the one being discussed this evening. It's with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker, Diana Dakey. Diana joins us today as a member of the State League's Government and Policy Committee. Previously, she has served as the president of Lackawanna County and is currently the judge of elections for Glenburg Township. In recent years, she has become the league's expert on Pennsylvania's primary system and the movement to end closed primaries. And so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Diana, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Okay, um, looks like my screen is shared. Um, Thank you for that introduction. And I wanna thank the um, Bucks County League of Women Voters for inviting me back to speak on this topic. Um, and I'm pleased to see so many interested people registered for this. <clears throat> well, I think it was approximately two years ago when I last spoke to your league. Um, the uh, League, league of Women Voters of Pennsylvania has been working on opening primaries for quite some time, as I will explain later in the presentation. Um, and I, I thank uh, Liz Fritch for um, picking up the baton and keeping this topic and effort going uh, in your local league. So um, why open primaries? Why is there this movement? Uh, well, many Americans feel that government is broken and partisan politics is the major cause. And like the effort to end partisan gerrymandering, a movement to open primaries is another approach to end the two-party stranglehold on the political process. It's been a long-held position of the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania that Pennsylvania needs to move away from the closed primary system and adopt open or semi-open primaries. Our current board and government policy committee supports the League's continued advocacy. Now, some League members are unaffiliated but you don't have to drop your party registration in order to advocate for equal rights of unaffiliated voters to vote in primaries. We as a league promote more people being engaged in voting. And this effort is totally in sync, as you see with our on your screen, with our slogan, empowering voters and defending democracy. So it's my goal to continue to inform league members and the public about this issue. So thanks for um, to Bucks County Legal and Voters for hosting this program. Okay, um, my screen, there we go. Um, so this is a, a brief outline of what I'll be covering uh, tonight and I'll be um, happy to take some questions uh, at the end. So um, why do we have primaries? Um, they're used to narrow the field of candidates prior to a general election uh, and um, determine the nominees for political parties uh, the Republican or Democratic parties uh, in advance of a general election. So we have this two-party system here in the United States. So primaries were adopted early in the 20th century with rules put into state election codes. Um, up until the early 20th century, there were no direct primaries and voters only voted in November. So without parties, <clears throat> primary leaders and special interests would get together and cut deals to select candidates. Uh, you know, the proverbial smoke-filled rooms uh, describe that era. 
Um, and but so our Pennsylvania election code primary rules go back to 1937. They are truly archaic given um, the uh, modern age of uh, voters. And, and also primaries do not apply to special elections. Here, uh, you Bucks County voters have a special election coming up. Um, so that a primary did not apply to that. Uh, in for a special election, the um, uh, county uh, party leaders um, pick a candidate <clears throat> to run in the special election. So <clears throat> let me um, uh, clarify primary types. Um, there's uh, two different, two general uh, criteria. One is whether you're open or closed. In open primaries, voter registration with a party is not a condition for participation. But in a closed primary, which we have in Pennsylvania, voter registration with the Republican or Democratic Party is required. And then, of course, there's partisan or nonpartisan, which means do you have separate party ballots or do you have just one ballot for all candidates? Um, so um, we have, um, you know, partisan ballots, separate Republican and Democratic ballots. So now this slide, I'm certainly not going to read this slide, but um, this is here to, um, this is based on my own research using um, several different websites um, to show you the um, wide variety of primary types here in uh, the United States. So, you know, the open at the top, the open nonpartisan primaries, um, the um, uh Nonpartisan is like when you have top top four followed by ranked choice voting. That's only Alaska or top two, um, three states. Then most of the states are open partisan. So that partisan meaning that, you know, there are separate ballots for Republican or Democrat, but they're open. So a voter um, it does not register his party preference with the state. The state's not interested in your party preference and doesn't record it. And then the voter can participate in the partisan primary of his or her choice. So that's most states. Um, you see some asterisks on there. Um, there are some efforts by state legislatures to close primaries in some states where they are currently open. And there is, um, uh, uh, citizen groups are working to prevent you know, that from happening. Then in the middle of the slide, you see there are degrees of open or closed. So semi-open, well, that's what the, the bills I will describe to you. That's what we're working on here in Pennsylvania. That's where the Republican uh, or Democratic ballots would be open to um, independent registered voters, not um, Republicans will still, and Democrats will still vote on their party specific ballot. You know, Republicans are not gonna vote on a Democratic ballot. Democrats are not gonna vote on a Republican ballot, but independent voters can, um, opt to vote on one or the other ballot. And then there's some other states have various other rules with some degrees of open or closed. Then there at the bottom of the slide, fully closed by statute, voters must register with the Democratic or the Republican party in order to participate in the primary. And you see, we are, we Pennsylvania are one of only a handful of states where we are fully closed by statute, that statute being our archaic election code. And um, again, look at that little asterisk there. You see um, all of these uh, states are working on efforts to open their primaries um, in, some, in some way. Um, now, um, the legislation I will be telling you about and, and, and what I'm telling you about here in Pennsylvania, um, or, or I should say this presentation is not all about the various different types of presidential primaries. Um, this particular slide is not about presidential primaries. Um, uh, so it, um, to um, find out about Pennsylvania primaries, um, there are different websites that you could go to if you are interested in this. And I think people will be coming more and more interested in this as the presidential primaries unfold. So in around 12 states, the presidential primaries follow different rules and the regular um, state, local, or federal elections. And you've just been reading in the news now about Utah, okay, where um, uh, they um, have a, um, a primary and a caucus. Um, you know, Iowa has a caucus and they have primaries for other offices. 
Um, and, um, it, you know, it's not, you know, widely known or understood by most people that Democratic and Republican state and national committees can decide whether to hold a state's presidential primary. Um, the last time we had a presidential primary, um, you know, once a clear um, winner emerged, um, you know, with the requisite number of delegates, um, certain a lot of states canceled their primaries. So um, this is... Um, uh, decided by the uh, Democratic and Republican state and national committees. Um, so this is uh, an example of the type of information you will see if you go to the um, FEC website. You get all this detail about presidential primaries and um, or whether it's a caucus or maybe it's both. So the um, uh, FEC tells you that establishing the date for a presidential primary and determining the type of primary varies from state to state. And this is different. This is due to differences in state statutes, party constitutions, party rules and regulations, party bylaws, and delegate selection plans. In some states, a caucus or a convention may be held instead of a presidential primary. Other states may use a combination of both caucuses and primaries for delegate selection. Now, here in Pennsylvania, we have um, uniform rules for primaries. Um, you go to one primary, and that is for all of the offices that are um, <clears throat> being voted in that particular year. Um, as you know, the uh, state offices are elected in the even-numbered years, and the municipal and county office election offices are elected in odd-numbered years, and, of course, the presidential election is um, elected in even numbered years every four years. This is the type of information you would see if you go to 270 to win, which is an interesting website I alighted on. Again, if you want to compare what goes on in various states. All right, so back to Pennsylvania and our closed primary state. You know, if you are not included, you are excluded. And all of these independent voters are um, excluded in Pennsylvania. If you're not registered as a Republican or a Democrat, you are barred from voting in primaries. So this is clearly some voter suppression of too many voters. So we're an outlier, as I showed you in a, an earlier slide. And you know why this matters, reason number one, we're excluding a lot of voters around one in seven. So let's take a look at who we're excluding. Well, when you wrote, um, register to vote, um, you, uh, it, it does, the form does tell you, you see, um, it, uh, it says to vote in a primary, you must register with either the, re the Democratic or Republican Party. I mean, that, that is disclosed, but um, a lot of people don't, you know, really think about that. Um, here, um, this is some data I got from the Department of State uh, in mid-January. So we have around 8.6 million registered voters in the state. Slightly more um, Democrats and Republicans um, as of this time. Uh, the other 344,000, um, the, uh, see the other, you see that line there? That's what people put in there. Um, and, but in the state data, the data, they lump together the green and the libertarian and the other. And that's 344,000. Uh, and uh, that 344,000 has been parsed by the um, ballot PA effort and myself. And it's estimated that um, there could be an additional of that 344,000, there's a, an additional uh, roughly 100,000 who may have written down independent on that line. Then the none or no affiliation, see, that's, see that over here on the form, the none or no affiliation. So those are 965,000. So if you had add uh, 965,000, add 100,000 out of the other, you've got you know, around 1.1 million voters. Um, but the, the nuns alone are, you know, around 11%. Um, uh, and then if you take the nuns plus the, um, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, none and the uh, part of the other, uh, 1.6 um, million there, you have around 13%. So that's a lot of voters. Um, so that's estimated as around one in seven voters. And uh, I need to throw this in here now because um, I'm um, using these terms interchangeably. Um, independent voter is like a broad catch-over, catch-all term 
Um, even the legislators who were sponsoring the bills, you know, when we had recent hearings, they were using the term independent voter. It's kind of widely understood. Um, but then the term unaffiliated is also used like unaffiliated with a political party. And then when I start talking about the legislation, um, it uses a more archaic term, unenrolled, unenrolled with the um, a major political party. So I wanted to uh, throw that in there right now before I go further. So who are independent voters? <clears throat> um, they are estimated to be 49% of veterans, which could be as many as 40,000 individuals in Pennsylvania. They might be around 47% of the under 40 years of age voter. And across the United States, independent voters are a fast growing block of voters, as well as in Pennsylvania. Um, this is a, the Gallup poll. Um, now this is not, um, so what we see here, um, they ask a question. This is not voter registration. This is Gallup's polling where they ask a question. In politics, as of today, do you consider yourself a Republican, Democrat, or independent? And 43 people told, or percent of people told Gallup that they are independent, which is far higher than the respondents who told Gallup that they are Republicans or Democrats, 27% each. There's a new uh, report on our Department of State website, and this is it. Um, so, um, in the recent, in the past um, four months, from um, 919 of 23 to the end of January, 35% of new registrants um, chose or are not affiliated with a party. So, in the pie chart, um, the blue is Democrats. Uh, 31%, the um, red is Republicans, 34%, and the yellow is unaffiliated with either one of those at 35%. So um, this is rather astonishing that in, in the past four months, 35% of new voters are choosing not to be a Republican or a Democrat. And then on the right, um, this um, new report shows you that it was roughly the same a year ago um, the um, where it was around 34%, um, the same period of time a year ago, 34% of voters um, were not, uh, chose not to be a Republican or a Democrat. So um, so anyway, so reason number one was um, why we need to care about this. We just are excluding far too many voters. All right, number two, uh, closed primaries just don't work for democracy. We have low turnout in primaries. Um, uh, my own uh, inspection of um, voter turnout, it seems like we get twice as many voters voting in the fall as we do in the primary. Um, we have a party base determining the primary winner. Uh, that's that low turnout. Those are the, the party faithful go and vote in the primary. And then, but then the primary winners who advance to the general election, they, they lack a true uh, voter mandate, sometimes even from their own party. And, and then when you think about it, one of those will be elected to office. And the, you know, the election might be decided in the primary due to gerrymandering or demographics, um, or, you know, or simply due to the fact that we have some heavily Democratic districts or some heavily Republican districts. You know, the, part, the primary might be the only election that matters to the voters in that district. And with the November election just being a formality. So, you know, more, more uh, exploring this issue a little bit more, why closed primaries don't work for democracy. And, you know, we legal women voters, we are defending democracy. <clears throat> so it's a problem when there's voter disinterest in the primary that, you know, just the base of committed primary voters are going. And then, then uh, if that results in voter disinterest in the general election, when voters say, well, who gave me these choices? That's a problem. And then if we have elected legislators um, not answerable to the wider electorate. That's a primary. And when, when elected, the uh, agenda is geared to avoiding future primary challenges. We're seeing a lot of that right now. And, and then also think about local government. That really matters. Yet few voters participate. And, um, and you know, but many municipal elected officers have no reason for any party partisan politics in order to fix your roads. That, that's not partisan. 
Um, a, a, a related issue was that if a ballot question, which um, we use ballot questions as the final step here in Pennsylvania for um, making a constitutional change, if that should be run in a primary, it runs the risk of being decided by very few voters. So um, the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, we've been working on this for a long time. And this is our uh, position on primaries, which is in where we stand. The League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania opposes the current system of closed primaries which excludes participation by electors. Electors is an archaic term for voters. It's the term in our archaic electorate, <laughs> election code. <laughs> it excludes participation by electors who do not register with one of the major parties. League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania believes changing the primary structure to one which includes all electors would increase voter participation and could reduce political polarization. League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania supports changing to an open primary system in which all electors, regardless of registration status, can participate in the primary of the major party of their choice, or a semi-open system in which electors who are not registered with a major party can participate in one of the major party primaries. And the same system should be used for both presidential and state and local primaries. So that's our position. That's why we're advocating for um, the legislative change. Um, so why open the primaries? Well, democracy needs participation. It, you know, Pennsylvania excludes an, an estimated, as we saw, 1.1 to 1.2 million or one of seven registered voters. And um, based on some work done by um, ballot PA repeal closed primary, I'll tell you about um, uh, movement uh, groups later, uh, they did some research and proposals to open primaries are popular across the political spectrum. And how about the cost? All taxpayers, uh, including those not registered with a party, are required to pay for primary elections at an estimated cost of 20 to 50 million for every um, primary. And, you know, our 1937 election code of the smoke filled rooms era, you know, reflects a different time and, and different needs. So, you know, we, how we will benefit um, increased voter turnout, greater voter impact on the choice of general election candidates. Uh, responsiveness of elected officials to a larger electorate. So, um, the ch what is the change for Pennsylvania that 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 could be possible? The what? Uh, Semi-open primaries to allow the unaffiliated or independent voters to vote in a primary. Um, and why? Um, well, we're working on um, the legislative approach. Um, making a simple change to, to the election code, which requires no constitutional amendment. And realistic, um, given our partisan voter registration, it might be too, leap of, uh, too large of a leap for Pennsylvania to give up that, you know, we don't think the parties might go along with that. And so the how then is we are reliant on the legislature to pass bills. And, and a simple change to the election code can be made with simple leg regular legislation. Um, but we are locked into the, or dependent upon the legislative process. We do not have a citizen initiative process. And um, just throwing out, uh, making a little segue here into um, states with uh, initiative or a referendum. Um, and we um, are one of the gray on the map. We do not have initiative or a referendum. You see there's um, other states that have that option. And some of those states have used citizen um, initiative to open their primaries. So um, what are, again, these semi-open primaries uh, also caused sometimes called semi-closed or hybrid. So the registered Republicans and registered Democrats would receive their party specific ballot and independent voters may request either the Republican or Democratic ballot. And more other states are already doing this, um, as I show, showed you in an earlier slide, um, uh, various states are doing this. Uh, some of them are, are using it for designated elections, you know, not all elections. Pennsylvania, we're not doing it for any elections. Um, and um, well, what about, um, now Colorado uh, recently um, enacted semi-open primaries. And um, so you're probably wondering, well, okay, how would that work with, um, mail, um, vote, vote by mail. So here's what they do in Colorado. Um, and this is on their website. Unaffiliated voters can now participate in the upcoming Republican or Democratic Colorado primary elections. And But this law only allows you to vote in one 
primary. Return only one ballot or your vote will not count. Two ballots will be mailed the first week of June, but you can um, vote and return just one Republican or Democrat. Voting the ballot does not affiliate you with either of these two major political parties. So simple. And uh, so that's what you can do in Colorado. We can certainly do that here. Um, the um, I wanted to show you some of the language in Senate Bill 400, one of the bills that's um, currently sitting in our state Senate. And uh, so they're using the, the words unenrolled elector, showing the person who's registered to vote within an election district, having selected none or no affiliation or independent in regard to political party on their Pennsylvania voter registration application. So they would have checked that box, as I showed you on the form, that says none or no affiliation. And then in the other line, they would have written in, you know, independent. And that's who the, the um, bill would newly enfranchise to vote in primaries. Um, and it would, um, um, you know, make um, uh, changes to the 1937 election code. Um, these unenrolled electors may ask to vote on one or the other ballot. They would not be, like in Colorado, not be bound by that choice in future elections. Um, but they registered um, Republicans and registered Democrats would still vote on their respective primary ballots. And other, and other third party voters and candidates would conti continue to participate in the general election. So they have a petition process. Um, uh, uh, once the uh, primary election is over, then uh, the third parties like the Green and Libertarian, they can start their uh, petition process at that time and their candidates participate in the general election. And also this is key, um, the, the, this change to the election code to primaries would not make a change to the party specific elections of committee people or offices. Um, and so those, um, uh, the independent voter would not be voting for your um, Republican committee chairperson, Democratic committee chairperson. So these are the bills this session. We have Senate Bill Boscola, um, uh, bipartisan co-sponsors, uh, Dan Laughlin, Lisa Boscola, um, in the House, House Bill 976, Marl Brown, she's a Republican, House Bill 979, Jared Solomon is a Democrat. So we had um, some great progress. Um, the House State Government Committee held hearings on uh, in June of 23, and the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania testified. I was pleased to be there to testify on behalf of the League. And then um, in October, the House State Government Committee passed both of these bills out of committee. And so these bills are now um, uh, currently um, in, you know, in the um, long um, set of bills that are tabled. You can go to the um, Pennsylvania House website and you see all these tabled bills and they're among them waiting for action uh, in the House. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, let me just go back to um, language in Senate Bill 400. Um, so uh, if you were a poll worker, um, and I'm a poll worker in our <clears throat> Glenburn Township, I'm our judge of elections, uh, and I know I know we can handle this. Um, upon confirming an unenrolled elector status as a registered elector, the elections officer shall ask the unenrolled elector in which political party's primary the unenrolled elector desires to vote. And the election officer, upon reply, shall record the unenrolled elector's selection upon the unenrolled elector's certificate for the purpose of that ballot. And for that ballot only shall be deemed enrolled in the party. Uh, and then, you know, here's some other poll worker instructions here. And then B, the ballot provided to the unenrolled elector shall not include a selection for political party officer or a member or officer of a party committee. Okay. So that will be in the bill. And then, um, you know, you're not, it, there's nothing about an unenrolled elector taking an action to vote in a primary that um, uh, puts any obligation on that, that uh, <clears throat> a voter to vote in that same party uh, in a subsequent primary election. And Senate Bill 400 has some uh, good language in there about um, how all this would be implemented. Um, they, the Secretary of the Commonwealth would um, collaborate with counties, provide guidance and training 
um, adjust uh, absentee and mail-in ballots. Uh, there might be some modifications necessary to the shore system to parse out um, what people wrote in uh, under other on their registration form. So um, this this shows you how um, we have a little history here in Pennsylvania. We've been at this for a really long time. So I have I have five years here. Now, um, Lisa Boscola said she's been working on this for 10 years. Um, I only got involved in this uh, effort around um, the year 2020. Um, but here, here's some bills you can see. Uh, Lisa Boscola has been involved all along, um, advancing legislation. Um, the um, uh, We see in, in 2000, the 2019 to 2020 session, okay, um, the Republicans controlled both the House and the Senate. So Senate Bill 300, um, Joe Scarnati uh, was the Senate pro tempore at the time. And uh, there were hearings in April 2019. And that bill passed the Senate with only eight and eight votes. But then sadly, it had uh, there was no action taken in the House State Government Committee. You know, so this points up to a problem with the um, rules in Pennsylvania and the League of Women Voters has been working on um, some rules reform. I mean, it, it's, it's you know, um, it, it needs to be changed. That something with uh, such wide bipartisan support in one chamber can then go on to die in the other chamber. Anyway, then um, above that, you see the 20 to 21 to 22 sessions. Um, so um, Senate Bill 600, um, Dan Laughlin uh, picked up the baton from uh, Joe Scarnati, introduced legislation, and the Senate State Government Committee um, uh, under David Argel held hearings. Um, the League of Women Voters sent a letter to that committee. Uh, and then um, uh, House Bill 1392, um, uh, Representative Quinn uh, introduced legislation, and um, uh, Representative Groves, House State Government Committee held hearings. Um, we submitted testimony, uh, and then up to the present, uh, in in, our, in the twenty three to twenty four session, I um, uh, already shared with you that um, House bills nine seven six and nine seven nine uh, have been voted out of committee, and they were awaiting action on the in the full House. And Senate Bill four hundred has um, it's in committee. It's been introduced. Uh, it is it has not received any um, attention in that committee. Um, we, um, we, we are not um, optimistic that it will receive attention in that committee because the chairman um, of that committee, Chris Dush, um, he um, uh, spoke during the Argyle hearing um, of, of the previous session, and he spoke in opposition to making this uh, legislative change. So uh, we're not expecting um, this session a whole lot of um, you know, some uh, Senate committee action. But, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, legislation happens in all kinds of um, interesting ways. Um, <laughs> a lot of interesting uh, things happen via the budget rather than normal legislation. Um, happens via, you know, uh, amendments to um, related bills. But um, but we're you know well um, the league intends to uh, persist in informing the public and uh, advocating for legislative change, um, you know uh, this session and in future sessions. Um, the um, wanted to show you that uh, it, it is possible even with that we don't have an initiative initiative process here in Pennsylvania, it is possible that uh, legislation can get this done and. Uh, here are some legislative um, efforts and successes around the United States. Rhode Island, success using legislation. Uh, Maine, um, success there. And um, that effort in Maine, um, you know, the League of Women Voters of Maine supported that. Um, uh, it was bipartisan. Um, they, uh, we have a lot of the same things going for us here in Pennsylvania that Maine had when they succeeded. Um, New Mexico is working on um, uh, it's a couple of uh, bills, both in the Senate and the House. Okay, so um, the um, what can you do? Um, so please be a change agent. Um, 
So contact um, Speaker McClinton to urge a floor vote on House Bill 979 and House Bill 976. Um, urge your state senator to become a co-sponsor of Senate Bill 400. Um, write letters to the chair of the Senate State Government Committee, uh, that's Chris Dush, and um, emphasize that it's time to open primaries to the over 1 million excluded voters. Um, you know, he's previously said that he's not in favor of this, but he needs to hear from us. Um, as a committee chairperson, he is in a pivotal role, and um, it, as a committee chairperson, uh, he can receive your uh, mail and email, you know, um, you don't have to be a constituent of his um, because he is a committee chairperson. Um, league members, please plan to participate in our annual lobby day of the Capitol this spring. Um, it was fun last year. Um, we're going to do it again. And um, just want to put in a little PR for that. And <laughs> so um, um, be um, alert for information uh, coming your way on that. Um, but uh, so why would, in, in terms of speaking to legislators, why would an incumbent legislator support opening primaries? So um, this is your this is uh, your your pitch here. Well, this is a, a reason to talk to voters other than the base, and a reason to talk about genuine issues, not partisan talking points. And then, seriously, engagement with more voters in the primary can translate into more votes in the general. You know, there's nothing to lose from from uh, talking to more voters. And you know, we're relatively new in the um, redistricting new redistricting decade where there are new districts and new voters. So this um, already presents an opportunity for incumbents to engage with new voters. And so why not, while you're engaging with new voters because you have a new district, why not engage with all of those independent voters that you haven't you know, engaged with? And that then the voters that connect with a candidate, candidate at the time of the primary, they may want to, by extension, support that part, party if they um, you know, establish a, um, a supportive relationship with a candidate. So why would any legislator be opposed? So, you know, we've gone through all these things. Um, the, the main reason is lack of information. Um, so legislators don't understand the sheer numbers of unaffiliated voters. And also share with them those new voter registration statistics that in the last four months, 35% of new registrants are not affiliated with a party. So we need to, we need to reach out to those voters. Well, or we need to get them voting rather. They We need to give them equal voting rights. And then legislators also have had this misinformation um, and we, we hear this um, at the hearings um, and we diffuse it there that, um, you know, there's this misinformation that there's gonna be meddling, one party meddling in the other party's primary and that is not gonna happen. There's not gonna be crossover or strategic voting. Um, you know, there's um, Democrats are not going to vote or will not be allowed to vote in Republican primaries and vice versa. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, independent voters are not organized. Like who is going to organize independent voters <laughs> and tell them, hey, get, you know, go vote, you know, do this um, cross. You know, it's just not going to happen. Independent voters are not some kind of a mailing list that's out there that's going to get mobilized to go do this, um, you know, um, uh, meddling in somebody's primary. And then there's, you know, these false reasons. And unfortunately, we heard that um, uh, at the hearing uh, in the House State Government Committee, it was that, well, counties can't handle this. But yes, they can. Um, you know, um, and there was somebody from um, uh, speaking about counties uh, testifying. And yeah, you know, um, change requires um, making a change. But um, they said, you know, if all of those other states in the United States can handle opening their primaries to independent voters, you know, Pennsylvania can get with the program and get with the modern era. Um, there's, I think this fourth bullet is probably the main reason that, elect, you know, um, politicians won't tell you why they don't support this. And it's this fear of changing the system that got them elected. And um, and so uh, I don't know how to overcome that. Um, uh, and then there's also, you know, complacency. It's like, well, you know, maybe we have more important things to work on. But um, that's where you come in to stress how important this is and how, you know, this really matters to you and matters to, um, you know, one out of seven, seven voters. So, um, again, for, to be the change agent, um, 
the uh, join the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, if you're not already a League member, to study, define, and take action on priority issues. Um, as Julie was saying, the, the League, um, we um, are a grassroots organization and we study issues before we define our position. Uh, and this is done through um, the grassroots um, study and um, a, a deliberation by our members. Um, and we, need, and as I mentioned before, we need rules reform because um, why does a bill um, that passes with wide bipartisan support in one chamber then die in the other chamber? Or, um, you know, why are a whole lot of bills, um, and including the two that just passed uh, this session, um, uh, the two House bills, um, you know, are those going to get voted on in the floor? Or are they going to, you know, get just swept under the rug? So we need um, you know, some rules reform to get, make, you know, push things along. Um, and then, um, so sign up with Ballot PA, repeal, repeal closed primaries. It's ballotpa.org. Um, so this is a, um, a statewide coalition under the leadership of the Committee of 70. And um, the League is a member of this uh, coalition. So with a little history on them, um, it, the, um, uh, the next bullet there is open primaries. See, open primaries is a um, national movement, um, openprimaries.org. And um, so um, open primaries, we had a state chapter, open primaries PA. Um, then, um, and this was under the leadership of the Committee of 70. And then um, it was rebranded by ballot PA repeal closed primary. And David Thornburg took the helm of that effort. Um, so um, sign up for, for, um, all of that. And then um, uh, for uh, more information, um, go to independent, there's independentvoting.org, another national movement, and there's a state chapter, paindependence.org. So there's, you know, a lot of ways you can engage with this movement and get information. So the key takeaways, um, fairness, we need to end voter suppression. Um, over a million independent voters are excluded from voting. Public funding. Primary elections are publicly funded and administered. No American should be required to join a political party in order to vote in a public election. Uh, and voter equal voice. Voters um, deserve to be able to have a say in who advances to the general election ballot. And closed prim uh, partisan primaries don't allow that. And we need, and better government outcomes is what we are uh, optimistic for, um, you know, government will be more effective when elected officials are incentivized to listen to their entire constituencies, not just partisan primary voters. So that that's my conclusion. And um, now we'll um, see if we have questions and we'll have some discussion. And uh, okay, I am going to great. So Diana, stop my share. Okay, stop share. Diana, this is Julie, and I will go ahead and read off some of the questions we received in the chat. Um, but actually, first, I would just love to say on behalf of everyone, um, thank you for all of the work that you've obviously been doing for this cause, and also to congratulate you on the progress that's been made. I think that um, clearly the State League has had a big part in some of the movement um, and much of the movement. And I, I congratulate you for that. And hopefully we'll finally see some headway on the issue. As you indicate on your one slide, this has been years in the making. And I, it sounds like we're maybe closest we've ever been. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to, um, you know, our, our government policy committee, we're, you know, we're working on this. I want to give a shout out to Rochelle Kaplan. I don't know if Rochelle's on tonight, um, but, uh, you know, she's been my buddy through a lot of this. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's truly a, um, you know, league wide effort. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll dive right in. So Sharon Forte asked, what are the chances that House Bill 976 and House Bill 979 will get floor votes anytime in the near future? So take out your crystal an ball. On that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an answer on that. You know, um, well, with the legislator taking uh, legislature taking this extended break, and um, you know, not due to come back for a few weeks, um, you know, what will they rush to get done once they get back? Um, and, um, uh, you know, one of those bills, um, was, um, sponsored by a Republican, one by a Democrat, you know, Joanna McClinton being a Democrat, 
um, is uh, likely to um, uh, bring the Democrat sponsored one, Jared Solomon's up for a vote if she has to choose between you know one or the other. Um, the I know there's this uh, special election in Bucks County next week. Um, will that change the uh, party control of the House? Um, you know, we don't know. And um, so, um, you know, things are kind of in, in flux right now. Um, uh, you know, if we, we kind of feel like we're in a holding pattern, which is unfortunate. Um, but um, we, um, you know, we, we know why we're in the uh, state we're in. Um, Barbara Sperry has asked, with a record of which ballot an independent elector chooses on primary day or by mail-in ballot, be kept or noted and be public information as it is for which electors registered with a party vote on election day? Yeah, I don't have a clear answer on that, but um, I, I believe the answer is yes, because there may need to be an audit of an election. So in order to um, audit an election's results, um, it would there would have to be a record um, and uh, kept for you know some period of time. Um, as I read um, that little bit of text from Senate Bill 400, you know it mentioned that the um, uh, on the voter certificate that the piece you sign when you come in to vote that the um, poll worker would need to record which ballot you are taking before handing you the ballot. So that will, you know, then be, um, you know, in the poll book. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I have one of my own. Um, your slide where you indicate how we can all be an agent of change. I wonder if there were just one thing that we all did when we left this presentation, in your mind, what would that most important thing be? Um, uh, could I make it two things? Is that, am <laughs> sure. I to make two? <laughs> well, it, one would be to um, contact Joanna McClinton and um, please um, bring up the, you know, uh, one of the House bills for a vote on the floor. And please um, uh, marshal your um, caucus around it, you know, reach and reach across the aisle to, um, you know, the Republicans and um, let's, you know, and this is truly bipartisan and let's get it done. Um, and, and then over in the um, Senate, then I would ask you also to um, send an email or a short handwritten note to Chris Dush, the chair of the Senate State Government Committee, and uh, tell him that this is very, uh, very important to you. It's very important to uh, over a million voters in Pennsylvania. And it can also be good for parties to have a reason to reach out to more voters. And I, see I think, you know, the legislators need to realize this can be good for parties. This, you know, what's wrong with it, with, with connecting with more voters? <laughs> Definitely. Um, we've also had a link added to the chat to go to our outreach circle um, that's hosted by League of Women Voters of Bucks County, which is also an ac excellent place to go. And um, that would allow you the ability to see action items related to this particular topic. So that's also a great thing to do. Yeah. Uh, join Thank the League Outreach Julie. Circle. That's what the plug in the chat is. So everyone who is in the chat and able to see that that link will help you do that. Um, I also wonder about cross cross filing a bit, since that already exists for school board elections. Um, it seems like we always we already have a bit of dabbling in other primaries than our own party affiliation through cross filing. So I it does sort of make one wonder what the opposition to that sort of election setup is but i think as yeah you right stated, um, yeah we do have cross filing so um you know it does it does make you wonder why um some legislators think someone's going to you know meddle in the other person's uh election uh, well you know the cross filing that that almost is kind of similar to a uh nonpartisan you know mm -hmm. primary <clears throat> however 
um, for those school board elections, the independent voters can't vote in those. True. So, <laughs> so they're still, you know, excluded from uh, voting for something so hyper local as your school board. And what would um, you say to those out there that just say that you should change your party affiliation before the primary and then just change it back if you want to change if you want to vote in a different primary or if you are yeah, an unaffiliated? A yeah, that's a personal choice. And people can do that. People can do that. Um, people need to pay attention um, to the register by dates that are um, posted on the um, Department of State website or on your county election board website. Um, people do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, personal choice. I don't see any more questions in our chat. So I think we're, it looks like we're finishing up a little early, but I'd love to pass it to you again, Diana, and make sure you you have the opportunity to make any closing remarks before I wrap this all up for everybody. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to the League of Voters of Bucks County for having me to talk about this vital topic. And um, I, I hope I've given everybody some good background information and some action items. And uh, thanks again. Um, join the league if you're not a league member. <laughs> when you join the league, by the way, like I said, we study issues and, you know, you'll suddenly be uh, very well informed on a wide variety of issues. So, so, okay. Thanks again. Good night, everybody. Of course. Um, and I'll just take this chance to once again, say thank you, Diana. And thank you to everyone who's joined us for this program. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a link to the recording will be available through our League of Women Voters at Bucks County YouTube channel. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that link in the chat for everybody, but it'll also hopefully be emailed around. Um, our league has two more programs coming up in March. The first is on Monday, March 4th, and is titled Vote, Every Voice Matters. Um, the issue of advocating for improved voter access and security will be presented. And then on Tuesday, March 19th, there will be a program about eliminating the Electoral College in favor of a direct popular vote. Both will be held at 7 p.m. through Zoom, and you can register for the events through our website, um, which I will also put in the chat right now. And finally, I'd like to just take a minute to invite anyone who's out there who's not already a member to join the League of Women Voters. Our Bucks County chapter has over 200 members who are passionate about our mission to empower voters and defend democracy. We are always excited to welcome new members and the new energy and ideas that they bring with them. Um, so please visit our webpage or reach out to any of our members to join. Thank you so much for your time. And we hope that you'll continue to engage with the League of Women Voters in the future. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.